Ladies and gentlemen, Football Scoop Podcast. It is Monday, the day after Colorado made a change. We're here to talk Colorado football, how Colorado football gets good again, becomes relevant again, because I got to say it, they just haven't been for a long time. Mike McIntyre had one winning season, and it then took him a few more seasons to get out. Um, very strange situation with Mike McIntyre. Um, Mel Tucker came in. Had a cup of coffee, and then Carl Durrell got hired. And I think we all shook our heads at that one. And Carl's a great guy; he really is, a very, very nice guy. Um, it just—it was a head scratcher. What Colorado needs is a great recruiter. You, you, they should build from within, within the state. They should focus there. They should start there. That's how they should have success. Um, bringing guys in is very hard at Colorado, uh, very, very high academic standards. And and they need somebody who can recruit and recruit locals who want to be there and want to rebuild the program. And we'll see how they get there. We're here to talk about candidates today. I'm Scott Roussel, joined with college football experts, Zach Barnett, John Bryce. Gentlemen, great to see you. Zach, I'm going to go to you first and ask you, give us a lay of the land of Colorado football. Where are they? Where are they going? And then maybe John and I can dive into some candidates. Zach, it's yours. Yeah, so Colorado was one of the top programs in college football in the 90s. They uh, okay. won a national championship in, John, was it 90, 91? 90. 90. They, won, they were national champions, co-champions. They were a fixture in the Big 12. Very, very nearly played for the national championship in 2001. And, uh, John, as you outlined in your piece yesterday, this century they've been to seven bowl games. So about one out of every three years they're going to bowl games. Uh, the, the program is – it's in sh- shifting sands, I would say. Like, uh, you know, the Pac-12 is uh, – its future is in doubt. And so Colorado has been mentioned as a program that, uh, you know, might be on the move to the Big 12, might stay in the Pac-12. Uh, obviously, whoever ends up hiring is going to have a lot of questions there. And frankly, you know, I don't know what the future holds there. Um, the landscape, Colorado produces between 10 and 12 Power 5 players a year, the state itself. And the Buffs have signed about two of those guys. So uh, you're going to have to recruit uh, Texas or California um, to, to win there. And they obviously have not been doing well enough because this team – uh, and hopefully they can change their trajectory. But this team, the 2022 team, is on its way to being one of the worst teams in Power 5 football history. How is it possible that a state produces, say, 10 to 12, you know, guys like you, you referenced there, Zach, and Colorado? I mean, the university, the flagship, gets two. I mean, that's and, your problem. Yeah, and and if that's your flagship school, and I would um, – I don't have – those numbers in front of me or or the demographics of the players, but you have to imagine a great portion of those are coming from the Metro Denver area. And Boulder is just 30 minutes North of Denver, basically. So um, that's, that's very uh, much highlighting part of the issues for Colorado. They've, when they've been at their best, they've kept in-state talent at home and they've been able to um, get the rest of their roster field primarily through Texas and California. And that's not what the Buffaloes have been doing. No, I mean, I think I think Texas has signed more four stars from Colorado in the last ten years than Colorado has, and Texas hasn't been up. So, it, what 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 sort of you know low homegrown talent has been plucked by the regional powers, your Oregon's, your USC's, Texas, Oklahoma, people like that? Yeah, and um, that that's a, a surefire recipe for disaster at any state flagship university. I would also point out that a lot of these troubles game when when Colorado left the Big 12 a decade ago to join the Pac-12. And at that time, I think a lot of people wondered about the fit. And and yes, as Scott alluded to, um, there's some strong academic standards there, and it's widely considered one of the top public universities in the country. Um, But it had managed that balance of top public university and being a really good football program for quite some time. And in those 90s that you referenced, Zach, they had a six-game bowl winning streak that ran almost until the turn of the century. So the drop-off has been so dramatic since that 2001 season um, that they they had the one, I think, Pac-12 championship game appearance that McIntyre led, and then they've just been desolate. 
I could be wrong about this, but I believe so. After Gary Barnett, I believe they've had one winning season, and that was that one winning season. I think Mike McIntyre was head coach for six seasons. I think he had one season in which they had a winning record, and it was that one you know magical year where it, things all clicked. But I don't think Hawkins had a winning season. I know Embry didn't have a winning season. No winning season since like 2005. I mean, one, one winning season, Mike McIntyre. Uh, I just looked that up, and you were correct. And that's, uh, in, that's embarrassing as a university. Yeah. It is. It plays in a major power conference. Yes, that that's the best word for it, embarrassing for it, for the entire university. Yeah, I know they, they have very they have very high academic standards. You got to find a way to work through that. Other programs have found a way to work through that and have had, have, have had success. I know it's a it's a high cost of living area. Living in Boulder is expensive. The university can find ways to make that work for their to their benefit, uh, and they currently aren't. So there, there's ways to to get the right amount of money to your football players to make that exciting for them rather than a challenge for them. And they they just haven't done that. They're not recruiting the right kids that want to be there. In my opinion, I think this job all starts with recruiting. And I think you've got to hire a guy who can recruit local talent personally. That's, that's where I think we go. Yeah. I think the brand of Colorado football is, is very strong. Uh, if you can get the right kids on the airplane, I think the brand, the brand, right. The brand could be strong. The, the, the I think the stadium looks like when Colorado's, Winning, it's a cool place to be, but obviously you got to get there. Three of us are all, I'm going to be polite and say over 30. And it, the brand is strong in our brains because we remember what happened back. You know, we remember some epic wins. I mean, we remember Cordell Stewart going deep. We remember Westbrook, the big catch. We remember championship years. I, I'm not sure it is with kids these days. Kids that are 17. What do they know about Colorado football? Yeah, one winning season in their lifetimes. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, but I would still say that it's a a visible brand, a very recognizable brand. Maybe they don't um, associate it with winning right now, um, but I still think that the the CU, the Buffalo logo, um, Ralphie running onto the field. I think those are things that kids playing football all respond to or know to know of. And recognize, oh, okay, that's Colorado. And one thing I would point out here, um, because it shows that su success can be accomplished and sustained there, Tad Boyle's Colorado basketball program has five or six NCAA tournament appearances just since 2012. Um, so you talk about the academic standards and, and how tough it is and some of those things, but Tad Boyle has found the winning recipe for Colorado Buffalo basketball and made it very much an annual factor in the Pac-12. Colorado, the University of Colorado, the the atmosphere, the location, uh, the environment—it's stunning. It's amazing. It's you get people there, and now if you're a great recruiter, you build your in-state base. You pull in a couple of guys who are under-recruited somewhere else for whatever reason. You bring them there with the opportunity to be stars, and you say, "I'm going to change your life. You get to live here." incredible place we've got all the right facilities the place is great they've got everything you need to build an incredible football program just go do it we got yeah, to recruit the best in state and we got to bring a couple other guys that we can develop from elsewhere who are so excited to be there it's changed their lives the trajectory of their lives let's go win a championship let's do something great i think it can be done yeah i agree let's uh right. let's dive into the candidates let's go yeah, so uh, for all you listeners out there, I have not prepped these guys with this list of names I'm going to hit them with. Everything you hear is from the top of their heads and their, their knowledge of the business. So let's start with uh, the, the most obvious list, obvious name on the everybody's list, Eric Bieniemy. Yeah, I, I read John's piece yesterday, so I'm going to tell you, I think we have different opinions on this. Um, and I don't know. I think Eric Bieniemy is an NFL coach. He's an alum. I get that. It makes so much sense, but it's just a different world. It's a different lifestyle. So to me, you investigate him and see if he's truly interested. I don't think he – I think he's interested to understand the possibility. 
I'm not sure people understand how much work goes into recruiting at this level. Uh, and I just, I don't think that's what he wants to do next. I think he's very comfortable where he is. I personally, you got to investigate him if you want to be in the guy and he's willing to go all in on recruiting. He could be, he could be a lot of fun at that level. I just don't think that's what he wants in life. Yeah, probably, probably not. But I think uh, if you're Colorado, that absolutely has to be where you start your search. That has to be the genesis of your search for all the reasons we've already outlined. He touches the epic glory of the program right there at the onset of, of that run of dominance in the 90s. He also showcases that it's a national program because he's a Louisiana native. And then you also have his NFL chops, his visibility, um, what he could do, I think, on a, on the recruiting trail, what he could instantly do on the recruiting trail because he's orchestrating or helping orchestrate with Andy Reid the singular uh, offense in the NFL right now, the most enjoyable offense to watch in the NFL. And it's been that way for a few years. And we saw it again last night as they absolutely picked apart Tom Brady's Tampa Bucks. So I'm not saying by any stretch he's interested. Also, I, I know some people question um, online or whatever, why would an NFL coach want to go coach at the college level? And, and I thought the enemy would get an NFL head job in the last cycle, and that would have changed all the dynamics on this. But – um, I will point this out. There are a number of power five head coaches who make more than a number of NFL head coaches. And so I'm not saying anybody makes their coaching decisions based on the top end dollar, but a lot of power five programs out there pay every bit as good or significantly more than some NFL franchises. Colorado who couldn't hang on to Mel Tucker <clears throat> and then went Carl Durrell. I just – I don't see Eric the enemy being like, yeah, uh, I'm in, guys. I just – I don't see it. It's just my opinion. Okay, uh, here's another guy that uh, has been a frequent topic on this podcast. Um, name on a lot of lists, local guy, Air Force head coach, Troy Calhoun. Yeah, I would um, – I mean, me personally, I would make him one of my first five phone calls um, because of what he's done, what he's sustained. Um, when I talk to coaches and I'm – uh, good friends with some of his former assistant coaches. Um, the respect that Troy already has throughout the state among prep coaches, I think is significant. And we've all outlined how terribly Colorado has done at keeping home talent home. Um, I think Troy Calhoun would be an ex instant impact in that regard. He's also proven that he can build and sustain a program for a really long period of time. And as a college coach pointed out to me yesterday when, when I was doing research for that piece, Troy, make, Troy can make a lot of sense because he's already recruiting nationally. And we've established that Colorado can't fill its roster strictly off in-state kids. Troy, again, already has those relationships from coast to coast because Air Force Academy is, is a, global, a global brand in that regard. I, I will um, I'll go a little bit opposite. If Troy's been there available for all the other hires. Like, why, why would they go to him now? Uh, really good football coach. I just don't think he's what Colorado's looking for. I'm not sure why not. I just – just give me my opinion. I don't think he ultimately winds up being the guy. Uh, Troy's a really good offensive mind, good overall leader. Uh, I just don't get the sense that's what Rick George is looking for for whatever reason. Um, if this guy was on the podcast with us, and uh, maybe we should get him in the near future, he'd probably tell you he's just what the doctor ordered for Colorado right now, and that's former – BYU, Virginia head coach, Bronco Mendenhall. I'll tell you, Bronco is signaling to everybody that he's interested. So Bronco's looking for a job. He's looking for the right job. You know, if you think about fit for Bronco, people brought him up for Georgia Tech. To me, that's not a fit at all. This one is a great fit. He's a, I'm going to come in and change the whole culture. It's the type of place he'd love to live, love to, you know, grow his family, uh, put down roots, hopefully stay forever. Bronco makes a lot of sense to me, uh, has recruited at a place that's challenging to recruit to, has has done exceedingly well there. Uh, and I'm referencing BYU more than Virginia. Uh, so I think Bronco makes a lot of sense. I think Bronco wants the job. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I, I think that he's overwhelmingly made it clear he would get back in for the right fit. Uh, I mean, obviously, as we discussed last week on the pod, he's back on his ranch in Montana. So that's a it's a regional geographic fit as well. Yeah, if it was me, I'd be willing to uh, almost shut the search down right now. 
uh, if, if Bronco gets the call. So moving on, this is a guy who's uh, by his, his play on the field, his guys play on the field is going to move up in the profession. And he's an alum, Illinois defensive coordinator, Ryan Walters. This is one of the first guys I would bring up uh, to me. Former. I think he was a team MVP. He was a captain. Uh, loves it from, from Colorado is, been so well praised throughout the profession at least the last i'm gonna say eight years you know for his work predominantly at missouri now at illinois i mean illinois defense is filthy right now and that's that's him that's what he has done under red bill must watch um ah, boy you want to recruit locally he can sell he's really smooth uh he's he, he He's a good ball coach. I, I got nothing bad to say. I, I think that would be a good hire. Yeah, and um, he he was very successful in the SEC, um, both on the field and in recruiting. Again, a, a huge element, a huge component of this job. What he's done in short order at Illinois uh, under Bielema is really remarkable. And um, they, they quite literally just uh, delivered the hangman's news for another job that will – We'll talk about on another pod later today there at Wisconsin. And so uh, Ryan makes a lot of sense. I think the question you have to ask is with where the program is right now, can Colorado afford to go in the direction of a guy who hasn't been a head coach or hasn't really run his own program? And I think that's just one thing that they would have to be comfortable with. I'm not saying that Ryan can't do it because um, I remember when he got the Illinois job and I remember what he did at Missouri. So he's got a lot of people in his corner and a lot of people that believe him. Okay, two guys that uh, have a lot of success in the region, in the conference as assistants, and went down to a lower level and are proving themselves as head coaches. That's uh, Sacramento State head coach Troy Taylor and Weber State head coach Jay Hill. Um, good football coaches, for sure. Real good football coaches. I, I suspect Rick George would be opening himself up to a lot of criticism with either hire. I'm not sure either would rally the fan base. I'm not sure the administration would get behind him. I'm not sure those guys have experience recruiting the level of academics that you've got to recruit at Colorado and the level of play on the field. Could they build the staff? Oh, boy, Zach, those are uh, good football coaches, but geez, I, I don't. I wasn't expecting you to ask about either of those guys, but that's they yes. wouldn't have been in my top ten. But it's interesting names. Yeah, they're they're really really good football coaches, and um, they've proven at the level they're at that they can absolutely win. Um, but it, as you alluded to, I think this has to be a galvanizing hire for Colorado. Um, I feel the same George way, George and the and the Buffalo Nation, so to speak, and. Um, those guys might need to make another leap before they can make the leap to a power five program like Colorado, especially a power five program like Colorado. That's uh, trying to figure out exactly where its hooves are going to be planted as we continue to see seismic shifts in the sport. Agreed. Okay. On that same wavelength, two guys that are uh, having great success as power five coordinators right now, that's Baylor's Jeff Grimes and Oregon state's Brian Lindgren. All right, so I know both guys, and I will tell you that uh, Jeff Grimes <laughs> fits the Colorado get your hands dirty. Let's go do this. Let's get everybody on board. Jeff Grimes, I think, would be a very attractive hire. Uh, if you put Jeff and Ryan Walters side by side, you know, for the Colorado job specifically, it seems like Ryan Walters makes a little bit more sense. Uh, Younger, more runway, uh, less expensive, and Colorado considers that. Um, you know, the local having played there, he, it just sells so well. I think he could be galvanizing, could recruit the state better, perhaps. Uh, you'd have to understand his plan, how he's going to build his staff, and who he'd bring with him. But out of those two, I'd go Ryan Walters over Jeff Grimes for this particular opportunity. Um, Lindgren, smart offensive guy, really smart offensive guy. Again, doesn't 
doesn't come to the forefront for this job in my mind. Any any thoughts, JB? Uh, I would just say what favors Grimes, in my opinion, is that Colorado has made a number of uh, defensive hires through the years, and those have not largely worked out. Um, when I talked with some some coaches and agents over the day on Sunday, um, a lot of people kept hitting on the fact that they need somebody exciting. They need an exciting brand of football. And I think uh, we're seeing it nationwide right now with a lot of the changes, with a lot of the speculated changes. You can maybe get a little bit longer runway if you're losing a game 52 to 45 than what you're going to get if you're consistently losing games 27 to 10. Like you've got to play some exciting football and you've got to bring some excitement to the fan base and you've got to um, – play a brand of football that's going to help energize your fans and make people want to fill the stands because it's harder than ever to get people into the stands in a lot of places right now. And you have to give them something exciting. So Ryan makes tremendous sense for his heritage uh, with the program, for his ties out there and all of that. Um, but then to me, one of the first questions you have to ask him is what's your vision for offense? Who do you want to be your offensive coordinator if we give you this job? Whereas with Grimes, you know, you're getting ready to get some excitement. Um, on that note, JB, I once spoke with a division one head coach who straight up told me his AD told him he would rather see him, uh, throw the ball and go three and eight than run the ball and go four and seven. So that's a very real, uh, dynamic you touch on. Yep. Okay. Two more, two more head coaches that, uh, have, uh, successful head coaching runs in the region and are available or could very soon be available. And that's, uh, Mark Helfrich and Brian Harson. Um, I think Helfrich is an interesting person you bring up. I had not thought about health. Um, Cerebral could resonate there. Uh, Recruited at Oregon. uh, Recruited well, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Um, Helfrich is a very interesting idea. If that happened, you'd be like, ah, that's interesting. This this could work out. Harson, uh, it's so awkward talking about Harson in another place when he's at Auburn. Uh, the guy thrived, you know, at Boise as the offensive coordinator and then came back. Uh, recruiting at Auburn hasn't been fantastic. Um, if you were available, it's an, it's an interesting idea. Um, but I, I like the way you're thinking here, Zach. If, if it was the end of the year, and um, even though Brian Harson hadn't gotten the ride on the shoulders off the field, but he had generated an eight and four season or something like that, then if I'm Colorado, you have a much easier time saying, okay, we're bringing this guy back to the region of the country where he's had tremendous success, and we're taking an SEC coach who just went eight and four in America's toughest conference and led them to a bowl or whatever. But I don't think any of us sees Auburn. Uh, generating that type of season. And again, I don't think a Harson hire uh, at this particular time would be um, would be what Colorado needs or perception wise would be what Colorado needs. Um, yeah. Helfrich, Helfrich, you know, um, is tied to a lot of great things at Oregon and, you know, you would get some exciting offense. Uh, I still have questions about um, how he could handle the transfer portal and how he could handle recruiting there. Right. Also, yep. with, with Harson, I think the timing would be really it, – yeah. it would just be hard. Okay, that's my list. Who did I miss? Well, I, I'll tell you who comes to mind is Tony Alford at Ohio State. You know, Colorado State guy. Uh, I'm a little surprised it, it hasn't happened at Colorado State after the Adazio debacle. That, wow. Uh, Tony would go in there and recruit really well, could bring a really good staff. I mean, a really good staff. So Tony's another guy, you know, same vein as Ryan Walters, not having played for the Buffs, you know, is, is a little different. But Tony's a guy I think comes to mind. I think you'll hear people talk about Bill O'Brien to a certain degree. You go through the Nick Saban school of revitalization, you come out a different man. And the agents, they, you know, what do you think here? Uh, and he could meld well with Rick George. So that wouldn't shock me, to be honest. Um, that, there's a couple of guys that come to mind. JB? I would say on, on Bill O'Brien, the thing there is um, he is in the college game getting the, the Nick Saban uh, head coach's rehabilitation car wash, 
Um, but he's also seeing Alabama be incredibly successful in the transfer portal. And I think that's a huge element in all these uh, Power Five openings that we're now discussing, five of them across the country already um, before the first week of October uh, is, is elapsed. And it's because, again, the seismic shifts in the sport, but because also if you get out in front of it, you've got a chance come December and January to truly – engineer um, the foundational flip of your roster, and then you've got a chance to be that much more competitive that much sooner. And that's what it boils down to. Everybody is making these moves, yes, because of the money and yes, because of the the shifts, but also with an eye toward how quickly can we get back to being a relevant competitive program. And with the transfer portal and with recruiting, those are ways you do it. Um, And again, obviously, Bill O'Brien is getting a masterclass on those elements at Alabama. I will tell you guys, I've heard from coaches and from an agent that Colorado does not do the transfer portal well at all. Um, there's some academic issues there in the university, and apparently the university is not super keen to relax those academic standards. So it's it's not easy to get JUCOs or uh, transfers in there. So will that be relaxed? Will there be a discussion? And for the right coach, will they say, yeah, we're going to work with you on this? We'll see, but that's a big deal. And, you know, if, if you want to rebuild and, and, and say, we're going to recruit for three years and we're going to get better, or do you want to say, I'm going to bring in four or five kids and we're going to become competitive right away because they're not competitive right now. We got to see where, where the university goes. Yeah. 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 For sure. You have to have some common ground there. Um, And maybe it's, again, like James Franklin at Vanderbilt um, when he was able to to fight some admissions battles there and get three to four more difference makers a year admitted into Vanderbilt that helped him uh, take that program to heights that it quite literally hadn't seen in a century. Uh, One other name I would throw out there uh, because it ties into the offensive realm and and, um, is out at Arkansas, and that would be Kendall Bryles. Um, I think the guy is going to be – a head coach sooner rather than later. He plays an incredibly or deploys an incredibly exciting element of offense. Um, and he's recruited in a lot of places. And again, obviously has very deep, deep ties in Texas. And I think we've established that, that Colorado has to be able to go into Texas and get some more players moving forward. Yeah. On the transfer portal, I think we've seen, I mean, there's a lot of transfers out there, but I think generally the three, there are three types of transfers that go places and succeed. And that's guys who signed with Power Five schools out of high school and are didn't play for whatever reason and are looking to go back home, which Colorado is not going to have as many of those as an Arizona State or Georgia Tech. Or it's guys who are looking to move up a level to guys who are looking to get on the field very much. This is their pre-NFL free agency. They're trying to go get get tapes so they can go make make a living in the NFL. Colorado is not going to be attractive to those guys because – Colorado hasn't been winning. So unless you go get a Tony Alford guys who have, you know, prior relationships with those guys, or it's guys moving up a level from the FCS or power five. And again, Colorado, not saying they can't go out and get those guys, but they haven't been. And if you're going to do that, it's going to have to be a head coach with previous relationships, guys who, um, guys, you hire guys who have previous, previous relationships with those types of players, because, Colorado's not an attractive option for transfers right now. That's fair. I, I suspect there are a few FBS head coaches that we have not mentioned that have been at their place for a little bit. And, you know, say change could be good. Uh, I think John and I might have our ears to the ground in the next week or two or three and see if some of that's coming to fruition. And if so, maybe we'll give you an update on on some of those guys who have said, hey, I'll have a quiet conversation and see if there's a good fit here. Uh, but for now, let's uh, let's leave that be and, and see what happens in the next couple of weeks. Sounds good. Let's let's do this again this afternoon, guys, and uh, hash out Wisconsin. Wisconsin might be a shorter conversation. Colorado <laughs> might take a while to make a hire. We'll see. Yeah. All right, guys, Football Scoop Podcast. We will keep you posted on footballscoop.com. Hit the scoop. Uh, talks about all the college openings, uh, who's being interviewed, who gets it, why they took that job, etc. Footballscoop.com on, on Twitter. On Football Scoop, he's John D. Bryce Juan. He's Zach underscore Barnett. Uh, we're there each and every day. Appreciate you. You're listening. We'll talk to you soon.